You're listening to Deal by Deal, a McGuire Woods independent sponsor podcast. Deal by Deal invites you to conversations with experienced independent sponsors and other private equity professionals. Join McGuire Woods partners Greg Hover, Jeff Brooker, and Rebecca Brophy as they explore middle market private equity M&A to provide you with timely insights and relevant takeaways. Hi, welcome to Deal by Deal, McGuire Woods and Independent Sponsor Podcast. Today we have a special guest, John Hewn of Compass Group Equity Partners, on to talk about specifics about the independent sponsor world. John, do you want to kick it off with an introduction of yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me. My name is John Hewn. I'm the managing partner of Compass Group Equity Partners. We're an independent sponsor based in St. Louis, and we're operating in this fashion since 2015 primarily focused in middle market or lower middle market transactions. We were focused in two areas. One is niche manufacturing and distribution, and the other business and consumer services. So within that area, we try to stay between the mountain ranges in the greater Midwest, looking for businesses with 2 to 12 million in EBITDA. And we've been fortunate to build a nice team and have some good successes. We now have 14 professionals. 12 here in St. Louis, two over in Kansas City, and uh, we've completed seven platform transactions. And then some of our businesses are roll-ups, so we've completed over 60 bolt-on transactions, are working on a, our second exit. So, so far, so good, and, and happy to be here today to maybe share a little bit of what we've learned along the way. Thanks, John. I also want to introduce my co-host for today, John Finger, my partner at Macquarie Woods who's heavily involved in our independent sponsor podcast. John Finger, do you want to say hello? Hey, everyone, and thanks, John, for joining us today for this podcast. John, one thing I was interested in is how you specifically got involved in independent sponsor work. Interesting question. I really evolved into independent sponsor work over time, and I think a lot of people would do the same where they take previous experiences and it and morphs into an independent sponsor role. I had done some entrepreneurial work in my early years. I'm older than the average bear, so that was back in the 90s, and then did consulting and intermediary work in the 2000s. And occasionally I would find a opportunity that was interesting to me that wasn't necessarily a fit for my clients at the time, and I began to invest personally in those businesses, and then over time added kind of the friends and family to help fund those. So that background was in place already for kind of a deal-by-deal structure. I then got into corporate development and had a short stint in a family office where we were deploying family capital, and that led to Compass Group. And as a result of that, I got very comfortable raising capital on a deal-by-deal basis, doing transactions, and Compass Group was born. That's really interesting. And, John, just kind of a break off of that, do you think that that's kind of, in your view, one of the more standard ways for folks to get involved in independent sponsor work, or have you come across other successful independent sponsors that have different paths? The truth is, I think independent sponsors come from a lot of places. They spin out of a private equity firm. They come out of an investment banking firm. They're entrepreneurial individuals that want to go launch their own uh, activities or even straight out of school in a, in a search fund. I guess in my mind, there's a wide spectrum of independent sponsors and what the definition is. You know, On one end, there are people who source a deal, coordinate some financing, earn a fee, and perhaps get a board seat in some sort of promote or economics on the upside of a deal. But the financing partner who might take that business on is really going to lead it. On the opposite end of the spectrum, which is where Compass Group sits, are people who really focus on sourcing deals, doing the diligence, packaging them up, closing the transaction, but also managing, providing oversight, assuring strategic initiatives are implemented and operating that business going forward as part of the executive team. And as a result, we have to have a team that, that's capable of doing that. There's no right or wrong answer on where you are in that spectrum, but I think people come from different experiences and therefore their expectation is a little different on where they sit in that spectrum. 
that's really interesting and really leads me into one of the next things that I was super interested to discuss with you. And as you focus on how different independent sponsors really sometimes serve different, both have different intention in terms of helping to market a deal, but serve different roles going forward. I'm really interested to know, John, what in your head are some of the key must-have financial or legal terms that you think through when you're structuring a transaction? I think you'd have to think about where you are on that spectrum, whether you're packaging a deal and handing it off or going to stay involved. But assuming you're staying involved and and working that business on a go-forward basis, i break that question up into a couple buckets. Bucket number one would be the financial terms. And of course, you want the fundamental economics for an independent sponsor, which might include a transaction fee, a management fee. And, and we've learned over time that you want a minimum because when those businesses struggle and if it's based on EBITDA and there is no EBITDA, you still want to get some sort of income to spend your time supporting that business. But in exchange, you often put a cap on it. And then, of course, the third component being carry and, and more and more, those economic terms are becoming fairly standard market terms. So, I, you know, I don't think there's too much that can be changed around there. We're always considering some sort of promote if there's a, an appropriate promote in there of some sort. We're all, always cautioned about the preference that some investors may look for. And my comment is always to pick your battles. My partner, Chris Gibson, always likes to say, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. So we want to be fair and ask for you know appropriate economics, but we also want to be reasonable and leave room for others in the capital stack because those capital providers will also have a layer of economics that they have to handle before the ultimate investor gets some return. So we try to be reasonable about that. That's on the financial side. Yeah, I do think that it might be helpful to insert here, Rebecca, that as it relates to the financial term, as John was alluding to, this ocean of independent sponsors truly is so diverse, as John alluded to. Mm -hmm. I think that it's kind of the beauty of the model in many respects, because ultimately that universe of capital partners is almost and sometimes more diverse. And so I do think that there's room for everyone, right? And marrying the right capital partner with the right independent sponsor is a bit of an art that John and and you and I, I think, have, have also become more attuned to. I think that kind of plays back to the whole, well, I think John and his team's economics from a financial perspective are largely have guardrails around them. I think it's also important to recognize that for different sponsors, that looks different. So John's kind of view of, quote, market is going to be different than the view that another independent sponsor might have, not because either one's wrong, but just because they're either bringing something different to the table in the way of how they're looking at it for the underlying deal. So I just think that's a a segue we might put in there, but then John, feel free to circle back to your other point here? Those are really good points, John. It does differ from one to the next. And we've bumped into some capital providers who have made comments like, uh, we'll make room for you to have a board seat. And that's just incongruent with who we are as a firm, because as a firm, we tend to be very involved in the management ongoing, where in other scenarios, that's perfectly normal that somebody would package a deal and hand it to a capital provider, and they would lead it and provide oversight going forward. No doubt about that. The other area, as far as legal terms, we talked about financial terms. If I thought about what the key legal terms are, obviously, McGuire Woods has plenty of attorneys to give us good advice there. But you know, one of the things that we've built into a couple of deals we've done that is attractive to us is that we have what we call exit control over a three times cash on cash return, which if you think about it, investors want to make sure that they receive proper return for the risks they're taking. Almost everyone would say the bellwether or the benchmark of three times cash on cash is attractive. 
And therefore, we've been able to negotiate that investors would allow Compass Group to pull the trigger to sell a business at our discretion, not the entire board's discretion, so long as we can deliver three times cash on cash return to those investors. That gives us a little bit more autonomy because sometimes when you put various investors together, some have a longer hold period than others. Sometimes you never really know. You should always know, but you don't always really know until you get further down the deal. So that's one. Another one, since it's tax season, I'll I'll bring up is that tax obligations for distributions that go along with K-1s should be cumulative over time, sometimes due to accounting rules or first-year economics of the business, you'll have losses and the company that may have tight cash constraints and the following year you have gains, you should be able to offset the gains with those losses before the company needs to start writing checks to their investors to cover tax liabilities that are passed through the LLC structure. So we've come across that and now that becomes a standard in all of our documents that the capital accounts need to be cumulative. And then uh, the other thing that we've really tried to make a standard for ourselves is to predetermine some allocation of profits interest to the management team and the inclusion of third-party advisors on the board. Maybe non-voting, but we've really found that, you know, while sometimes mile wide and an inch deep, having deep expertise on the board with advisors helps a lot. Oftentimes in the type of structures that an independent sponsor puts together, you have a couple great investors who also want a seat on the board and they deserve that, but they don't necessarily have deep expertise in the specific sector. And by finding those advisors, it has really helped us challenge the management team and guide these companies forward. So those are the couple things that first came to mind when it comes to general legal terms. Those are all really valid and interesting points, and I I also appreciate very much that they may vary in terms of both financial and legal terms that are truly important to you as an independent sponsor, depending on what your big picture goals are and where you are in kind of the life cycle of your field, as well as how involved you intend to be with the pump company going forward. And, And John, I'm just wondering, have you seen over the course of your career of doing these deals, deal by deal, whether the things that you really focused on have modified or changed at all? And if so, are there any when you were kind of a fresh investor that you viewed as more critical than you do now? Well, certainly they have changed over time because we've learned by making mistakes. (laughs) So uh, we try to learn from our mistakes. Candidly, in the early days, we were happy to have the capital to close a deal. And now we're happy to have a network of capital providers that we can work with that may vary from one deal to the next. The size of the transaction, the end market of that business, who can bring can bring value above and beyond capital. So we're able to be a little bit more selective. I would say early on, our goal was to make sure we understood the fundamentals and we've been able to be a little more nuanced now that we're further down the path and have repeat investors. What we've also learned is it's not always wise to be too creative. We've had a few transactions that we think are really special and therefore we try to change the dynamics. And the industry is fairly used to certain economics or certain terms. And of course, lawyers can identify what are standard or market terms as well. And if you stray too far from those things, you start creating a whole nother dynamic of challenges and maybe, you know, even people backing out that, of course, you don't want to have happen. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something we can all relate to, that you want to be creative and think outside the box, but sometimes that can work against you. Totally understood. Well, it's maybe a little bit out of our flow, but since you brought up capital sources, it would be great to hear what you look for in a capital provider specifically. And obviously, I understand it's going to change deal to deal in terms of the right fit and how that's maybe modified over the course of your career, understanding that probably out the gate, the answer is, can they write a check to some degree? Well, that's the first start, of course. And my general attitude, and it's 
we're in a good market right now. There is plenty of capital out there. And so if you have a quality asset at a fair valuation, no one should have trouble finding that capital. We believe that it is still a process so that we want to talk more than one and certainly talk to a handful or a dozen or more individuals to really understand what they bring to the table in addition to that capital. Do you want a single backer or do you want a couple investors in the mix? We always try to think about the size and shape of the check, of course. How how big is the deal? What kind of industry expertise they may have? Are bolt-ons expected? And all of those things have to come into to play for us to find not just capital, but the right capital for a transaction. You know, if you're needing to raise $40 million in equity, you probably don't want $22 million checks. And if you get four $10 million checks, you've got your pool. On the flip side, if you're raising $10 million in equity and your investors want to write minimum checks of 10, you're either going to have one or you need to look at a different pool of investors. We really try to match all those things up. It never ceases to amaze me how somebody who is a regular and consistent investor with us will say, oh, we had a deal in that space. It didn't work out for us, so we're going to pass on this one. And and the discretion that investors get on a deal-by-deal basis is part of the attraction for them. But for that same reason, we never count on anyone until we've really explored the business fully with them. It really is, as John Finger states, much more of an art to find the right people with the right appetite at the right time, with the right check size. To do that, we end up talking with a lot of folks. With that said, we also believe that good partners are hard to find. And as a result of that, when you find good partners, I really encourage, and certainly we have gone back to those same partners, where maybe the economics aren't quite as good as you could negotiate elsewhere, but you know what you're getting. You know how to work together, and there's going to be no surprises, and there's real value in that. I think that's a really important point for a lot of independent sponsors, particularly, and you alluded to this just on your life cycle, but I think as it relates to the earlier in their evolution independent sponsor, okay, so let's just call it what it is, looking to get your first deal done, I do think it really is important not to be focused on when I tell my buddy who's another independent sponsor what my carry is, am I going to be embarrassed or am I going to be worried that I didn't get enough? And for me, and I'm sure you felt the same, it was in your instance, looking back on it, I think ensuring that you have that trustworthy, good partner who ultimately is going to be there when you need them, i.e. at closing, but then also is going to be the right partner for the business going forward. I do really think that in hindsight, a lot of more seasoned independent sponsors looking back would say, I really should have been more focused on some of those things versus getting an extra 5% in a carry or 50 grand on a management fee or whatever it is. I think that's really important for a lot of any sponsor, but particularly in those early days, the most critical thing is getting your first deal done. That's absolutely right. The fact is people who play in this industry tend to be fairly confident people, and I would avoid the word cocky, but uh, you might call the, us that as well. And, and so the real goal is just getting a deal done, getting some experience under your belt, because it's the next and the next that really build up a portfolio that makes sense. Now, If you're an independent sponsor that's looking to do one deal and then run and operate that deal for the next five years before you do another, you may have more sensitivity to that. But those who are acting like a private equity firm, but on a deal-by-deal basis, you're working to have repetition and be able to repeat successes again and again. And you can tweak following deals, but maybe not try to call that back out of the first one. Those are all really interesting points, and I think something that a lot of our listeners are interested in, particularly for the ones that are newer to the independent sponsor, are how do you go about getting your capital providers? I think this was great to talk about that process. And another question we get asked a lot 
John, for folks like you to speak to is what is your process for deal sourcing? And also, again, you know, what is it now? What did it look like when you first started? There's, I think, a lot of folks look at the independent sponsor world and think, well, is it because those deals couldn't get a banker? Or how, how do they go about getting those deals? And I think cutting through some of those myths and also talking about some of your practical processes, which some our listeners would love to hear about. Yeah, so uh, that certainly has evolved over time as well. Compass Group started with uh, yours truly, and my background was in corporate development. And as a result of that, I have a saying that is, M&A is a tactic, not a strategy. Your typical agnostic private equity firm just wants to find businesses with decent economics and margins and acquire them. And I think the marketplace as a whole has matured to the point where you can't just financially engineer businesses. You have to really operationally change and improve businesses over time. And as a result of that, LPs or investors appreciate bringing that incremental value to the equation. As a result, you should go out and find deals in areas that you know, areas that you're familiar with, where you have contacts, you have expertise, you can bring value and really work side by side with your company or companies to bring that to the table. And investors appreciate that. So in the early days, investors want to see that you have found an opportunity that maybe wasn't on the market that you can bring value to. And as a result of that, perhaps a lower purchase price and or better performance makes room for the economics for both the independent sponsor and the investors. And I think that that is absolutely how we started and we still operate today. So our number one differentiator in our mind is that everything we do is thematic. We start with a theme and research it and understand it. Everybody in the firm immerses themselves in their specific theme, reading trade journals, talking to consultants, bankers, going to the conferences. Trade shows will come back and we'll go to trade shows again and then really allow themselves to become more sophisticated and knowledgeable in that specific space. Of course, create target lists, network to get to those folks, write letters, make phone calls, and do the hard work to find proprietary deals. So we're still doing that today. We're just doing that with 14 people as opposed to one or two. And like many firms, as they grow, we also want to stay in touch with bankers and brokers and other referral sources. So we have a full-time dealer origination function. Those of you who are out there in the marketplace uh, may have met Stuart Knoll. If you haven't, you will, because his job is to be out there telling the story of Compass Group and making sure he continues to be aware of all the opportunities that may fit one of our themes that a banker or broker might have in the market or so. We really have dual paths when it comes to how we source deals, but it all goes back to that original function of finding a deal that is unique, that isn't widely marketed, and where you can add value. And for us, that's true thematic sourcing. That's really interesting. And I mentioned to hear you talk about working with bankers and brokers. How often do you find yourself having you know, kind of independently sponsored deals, independently sourced deals rather, versus you know, hearing about them through your contacts that are bankers and brokers? So the way we see it is a little bit of a spectrum. What I talked about is the proprietary deal that you've sourced completely on your own that is not officially on the market. That's the holy grail, but they admittedly are few and far between, but that's what you're looking for. The opposite end of the spectrum is a banked deal that you know is broadly marketed with a full auction, and a banker is going to force everyone to hit deadlines for an IOI and LOI and renegotiations, et cetera. And those are plentiful, you know, thousand plus books a year are floating around out there, and we rarely win and don't want to win in those uh, scenarios. Somewhere in between is what I would call a, a brokered transaction where professionals, intermediaries are bringing a business to market and bringing some of the value of 
packaging it and uh, having the sellers prepare and be comfortable with uh, the pending transaction. But that real value can be found there where educated first mover advantage can get those under LOI. And that's where we like to play in that space where, again, we've researched an industry. We know what we're looking for. Brokers tend to stay in specific industries, as do bankers. And therefore, if we can find the right contacts, we start to see deal flow because we've researched and understood that industry. We're able to move more quickly and get those deals under LOI. The same can be said of banked process or formal auctions. It's just more difficult. Where, um, But we do believe, and we have experienced it ourselves, that if you bring true value, that operational expertise, and can differentiate yourself from others, you are able to perhaps get that deal out of a full auction process as long as you're in the ballpark economically. Hey, John, on that yeah. point, back to you know, kind of your history as an independent sponsor, I think from our seat, this segment within private equity has really evolved over the past, call it, 10 years. But maybe talk to the audience about, you know, your perspective on, and, and I know every situation is going to be different, but let's just assume that the broker or the banker is asking, okay, where does your money come from? Do you have a fund? Who are your relationships? How have you seen the evolution of the ability of an independent sponsor to, in some semblance of a process, still be successful navigating the question about, okay, you don't have a committed fund. How do we know you're going to get to closing? Have you seen the broker-banker community evolve in how they think about independent sponsors? The short answer is yes, I've seen them evolve, but I would tell you they are not there yet. Sometimes we simply have to be a little bit egotistical and, and look them straight in the eye, even if that's over a Zoom call these days, and say, look, we've done 70 transactions. We get our transactions done. We will finance and get this one done too. And because we can point to a track record and we haven't busted deals due to lack of financing in the past, we're usually able to win that comfort. But that doesn't mean that there's still a sense of concern over us or others. Are you sure you can get this done? In fact, I'm well aware of at least one transaction we were working on in 2019 that we felt like we had the, a good relationship and we were right there financially. And we believe we were passed over for somebody who had a dedicated fund. And so I do think it still happens. I do think there's a challenge out there, but there's no doubt that the prominence of independent sponsors and the way that industry has grown has made more and more people comfortable with that. One of the ways that I think it's fairly common to combat that concern is to get your financing partners in early so that when you go to a conversation or get on the phone with some of these targets, you're doing that with a financial partner next to you. May not be the ultimate or final financial or only financial partner, but if your funding source is on the phone with you, writes support letters, which they're all very used to doing, or even going to the management meeting or dialing into a management meeting, those types of things, I think, build confidence for the seller's representative that not only are you going to find this deal, but you're not going to be running around trying to finance it, that you're a little further down the path when it comes to the financing. That's really interesting practical advice, John. And something that is in my practice have seen just some hesitation for bankers to work with independent sponsors. So I was particularly interested in hearing that response personally. And we still have some work question. to do for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. Although I, I do think that it has, listen, in, in my experience again, has become much more well known and just kind of accepted industry, and particularly, I mean, it Compass Group is, is in a little bit of a, of a different segment because you're so well established, but even for some of the newer independent sponsors, but yeah, it is 
there's some work to do still. I acknowledge that. One of the things that you know we were interested in getting your take on, John, is are you seeing, I think last year was a really interesting year in m and a just generally with COVID, but also in m and a and watching how that all played out and some of the impacts that it had on valuation and fuel flow in fourth quarter and kind of overlaying with the election and change of administration, probably 2020 is going to probably go down as one of the more interesting years that any of us practiced m and I would expect. But was yeah. curious to see if, <laughs> if kind of in the, you know, hopefully the world kind of slowly getting its way out of COVID and administration change in the U.S. and still in what is in a lot of ways a bit of a boom market for deals. What are you seeing in kind of your deal sourcing and your practice and your negotiations? Is any sort of key trends that you think are going to carry through 2021? I would agree with you. 2020 has got to be uh, one of the most unusual years in our life, or so we hope that we'll never experience that again. I do think everyone feels like things are getting, quote, back to normal, even though it may be a new normal. Many more Zoom calls, which actually is not always a bad thing. You know, we used to travel a whole lot and time on airplanes and airports limited the amount of interactions we had time for. And with Zoom, we're actually able to see more people and talk to more people more quickly. And then, of course, now things are getting back to normal. We will get on a plane and go visit face-to-face to build that relationship. And everyone I talk to in the industry, I think, is feeling that as well. Pretty universal answer of how things are going is we're wildly busy and a lot of activity is going on. One thing that I want to mention before I go any further is that I think 2020 was an interesting year in a lot of ways, but one of the things it demonstrated is the value of the independent sponsor, right? There were a lot of private equity firms that have large portfolios or fund of fund type investors that have even larger portfolios. And those private equity professionals were scrambling to assess 10, 20, 30 companies in a portfolio. And they just didn't have the horsepower to dig in and get hands on and help navigate some of these companies through some very challenging times where in general, and these are broad generalizations, The independent sponsor world knew their businesses, they knew their end markets, and they were able to go and get hands-on and help these businesses through some challenging times. And I think that it was an opportunity that independent sponsors were able to show their value and what they bring to the table above and beyond just a financial buyer of a business. And I saw a lot of that in 2020. So Maybe that's the silver lining for the independent sponsor industry. But getting back to kind of where we see this going, I think things are getting back to normal. I think, as I said earlier, economics are becoming more standardized. So you can go out there and have a conversation without having people need to be educated on how an independent sponsor transaction works. Capital is plentiful. I think it will remain that way. There are people who are recognizing the beauty of the the model and the desire to go deal by deal or along with LP investments into funds, also wanting to do direct investment. Interest rates from all appearance will remain low. That means valuations will probably remain high. It's driven by capital available on both the debt and equity side. So I don't expect those are going to come back down to more reasonable levels at any time soon. But that just means, again, that an independent sponsor can go out and find a proprietary deal and bring real value and deep insights, a less competitive process, and therefore make room for the economics that we were talking about. So I think all those things are setting up very well for the independent sponsor to bring real value as opposed to just paying whatever it takes to get another deal done and deploy capital. That's really interesting, and I think it's wonderful that you were able to experience ways in which kind of the deep focus on particular sectors allowed your businesses, your portfolio companies to flourish during 2020. I think we'd love to hear one of the things that universally us as humans have loved to hear is just 
kind of stories coming out of last year that are success stories. Also, out of curiosity, I'd love, John Finger, for you to talk a bit to what you're seeing in your independent sponsor practice on the legal end as any sort of key trend in that practice that you see possibly just coming up in 2021 that are a bit unique or that are coming out of COVID or the deal boom of last fourth quarter? Yeah, I think a, a couple things, maybe less in the weeds on the legal side, but more just kind of structurally, and John would appreciate your perspective here as well. But two things I'd highlight. One, we continue to see a very strong movement toward hybrid structures where, to some extent, marrying right the best of both world, the independent sponsor world and the committed fund world. And so whether it's family offices or other institutional investors, creating these hybrid structures, call it a JV, call it a partnership, pledge fund, write a first refusal, however you want to frame it. But I do think that continued movement to really trying to create strong bonds with independent sponsors that capital partners are really excited about doing deals with. We've seen, at least in McGuire Wood, a very strong movement in that direction. Not to say that any of the true deal by deal is going away, but I just think we've seen as the model has evolved, I think that approach has evolved. And then the other thing I'd say is, I do think that as that universe of independent sponsors continues to grow, at the end of the day, it is it is bandwidth. The, the capital is there, but I do think a lot of the capital partners are starting to feel like they want to be a little bit more curated around their independent sponsor network, and that through getting introductions or validating someone's history, where they came from, how they are on deals. I think the capital partners are also taking a harder look at where they're dedicating their time and attention to in the independent sponsor world. I don't know, John, on, on either of those topics, if you had any comments you want to throw in there as well. Yeah, certainly the latter one makes a lot of sense to me. We have seen people who want to get into direct investment, so great partner for independent sponsors, but they don't know how it works. They're used to investing in a fund and having that kind of blind fund mentality, here's the dollars, go figure it out. So they are much more careful. I think this is what you were saying, curated. They're much more careful who they partner with because they're hoping for or expecting to have repeat or multiple transactions with a partner. They simply don't have the staff and the team to look at deal after deal after deal that might come pouring through if they had a big, broad network of independent sponsors. And I think that works well for the independent sponsor because the truth is, after doing dozen plus transactions, it's still a burden for us at Compass Group. Even though we have a database of investors and we can go find that capital, it's still a burden to go out there and educate and communicate and pitch your deal and then have, for whatever reason, that they just invested in a deal, so they're taking a pause, or they've had experience that they don't like that particular deal, or in some cases, they've invested with us and they want to let a a deal ripen before they invest again. There's just always some dynamics there. So having a smaller number of investor partners, still some number, but a small number where you can build a real relationship and get to know them, I think works for both parties. One of the things that I've always enjoyed and appreciated about the independent sponsor community is truly how communal and collegial and helpful and connected the community is. And so I think what I would put out for any independent sponsor, particularly the newer ones, is leverage the power of the community. I mean, we have, John, hopefully here in St. Louis, we'll get a group going, but we have these chapters of independent sponsor groups around the country, and everyone is so truly invested in the other's success. And so I think for the independent sponsors who are maybe just getting started out or newer is 
leverage that power of community. Reach out to folks who are you out there, John, but reach out to other independent sponsors. Reach out to Rebecca or, or myself and ask us a question and who might have dealt with this. And do you have someone that maybe has dealt with this space and this nuance? I guess, long way of just getting back to the community is, I think it's because everyone knows what it, it was like. Take advantage of the, the community's interest in being helpful, whether it's through us and, and then directly or indirectly with people like John and other independent sponsors out there. Yeah, you know, John, that's a great point. The fact is, this is a tough world to go out and get your first deal or your first few deals done. And it takes time. So people who think they're going to go do this in six months should recalibrate their expectations. You know, this takes a year or more and probably years before you get comfortable that deal after deal, I can keep doing this and it's, I can replicate it. With that said, you talk about the community. I agree. A private equity firm tends to have a broader mandate. They're looking in a lot of areas. They may even be agnostic. Therefore, they see every other private equity firm as competition. We don't see it that way at all. And I would agree with you that because independent sponsors tend to be more focused, whether that be focused in their geography or focused in their size range or focused in their specific sectors or thematic areas, we see a lot of deals and we'll flip deals to others that just don't fit us. But we've met others over the years that we know are in a specific space. And there's a lot of activity going on out there. And I think you can learn from each other. But if everyone's looking for something slightly different, the collective benefit of keeping your colleagues in mind as you see opportunities can really help each other out as well. That's really a wonderful note to end the podcast on. I think in so many ways, the power of community is one of the reasons that a lot of us really love and appreciate the crews that we have. And one of the really fun and interesting parts of being able to be lucky enough to work with independent sponsors. So I'm really glad that you both touched upon that. I enjoyed the conversation and, and appreciate having a chance to, to share what we've learned. Yeah, I really very appreciated, John, for you to participate in this. And I know in terms of just, again, the feedback we've gotten from our audience in the first few podcasts, they're going to be really hungry to hear your thoughts on this. So just in advance, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This is Rebecca Brophy at McGuire Woods, a partner in our M&A practice group. I want to thank you for spending some time to listen to the thoughts of John Hewn, managing partner of Compass Group and a very successful independent sponsor, and also my partner, John Finger, in our McGuire Woods M&A practice group. We hope we'll listen to our next episode of Deal by Deal. It will be coming out monthly. And please reach out to myself, Rebecca Brophy, or my partners, Greg Harbour or Jeff Brooker, if you have any questions or thoughts about what to include on the next podcast. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Deal by Deal, a McGuire Woods independent sponsor podcast. To learn more about today's discussion and our commitment to the independent sponsor community, please visit our website at mcguirewoods.com. We look forward to hearing from you. This podcast was recorded and is being made available by McGuire Woods for informational purposes only. By accessing this podcast, you acknowledge that McGuire Woods makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in the podcast. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily reflect those of McGuire Woods. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state and should not be construed as an offer to make or consider any investment or course of action.